In the beginning, it was about bringing down the president, but now talk of removing Syria's leader Bashar al-Assad appears to have gone quiet. At the cost of hundreds of thousands of lives and billions of dollars, could he be thinking that he's won? This is Roundtable with me, David Foster. Uh, the more than six years of the Syrian civil war, in fact, is coming up to seven, have changed the country and the region forever. Even if President Assad remains in power, he will be ruling a very different society, a nation divided in the face of monumental violence and huge international pressure. What or indeed who has managed to keep him from being toppled and how secure does he now look? It was an uprising against a repressive regime. It became a battleground for world powers looking to impose their vision on the region. The president, Bashar al-Assad, is still there. In any sense, is he the victor? Once the country's biggest city, Aleppo became a center of opposition to the Assad regime. It was retaken by the Syrian government a year ago. Other territories followed, with help from Iran and Russia, which may have tipped the balance in Assad's favor. Without uh, for the help of, of, uh, of Hezbollah, of, of Russian air power, of Iran-led militias, um, Assad could not maintain um, the hold of the, of, of the territory he has at the moment, let alone capture the whole country. In 2015, Russia entered the fighting, helping the regime's depleted forces. It launched air campaigns, supposedly targeting terrorists, but killing thousands of civilians. Iran, too, has sent in Hezbollah fighters to counter Islamic State, Daesh, and they claim as an anti-imperialist presence in the region. Since 2011, almost 500,000 people have been killed and more than 10 million Syrians have been displaced. President Assad says it's the economic siege imposed by the West that is making the humanitarian crisis worse. He maintains that all he and his allies want is to rid Syria of terrorist groups. Groups, some argue, that he helped to create. At the start of the uprising, uh, the Assad regime released uh, Islamists from jails that ended up becoming a core part of, of uh, ISIS the leadership and, and rank and file um, but also by refusing to heed demands uh, Syrian demands for reform and for, for the brutal crackdown of peaceful protests it created a vacuum in the country that was bound to be filled if not by ISIS by al-Qaeda or some other radical elements The world watched as evidence emerged of sarin gas attacks on civilians. The UN says the regime's forces have used chemical weapons more than two dozen times. Despite all this, Assad remains in power, challenged but unmoved. Assad's regime has proved so far impossible for a fractured opposition to topple. And his presidency looks set to continue. The priority has shifted to supporting Syrian refugees displaced by the conflict. As world powers continue to fight for control of the region, whoever wins, it will be Syrian civilians who have suffered the most. I'm very pleased to say that joining us for this edition of Roundtable from Arezzo in Italy, that's via Skype, Joshua Landis, a Syrian affairs specialist, who's also the director of the Center of Middle East Studies at the University of Oklahoma. Here in the studio, we have Ibrahim Olabi, the founder and executive director of the Syrian Legal Development Programme. A lot of work on the ground in Syria in the last few years, and we'll bring some of that up. And we also have Omar Imadi, senior fellow at the Centre for Syrian Studies at the University of St Andrews, and we'll talk about, Omar, some of your family in Damascus, if we may, during the course of this programme. But, Josh, if I can come to you first of all, would it be fair to 
make the assumption that barring Assad being assassinated, barring Iran or indeed uh, Russia saying we no longer have a use for you, he's going nowhere, he's staying put. Uh, indeed, Assad believes that he has won today. And in many reasons, you know, he has reason to believe that. Russia and Iran have both backed him. The rebels are on their heels. Many have given up. There are still pockets of rebel-held territory around the fringes of Syria, but they haven't made any progress. The world has stopped funding them largely. The Kurdish region has been supported, the Kurds have been supported by the United States to take 25% of Syria, 50% of Syria's oil. It has much of Syria's agriculture, best agricultural land. So that's a very important loss to Assad. He's going to be trying to get that back, uh, hopefully through negotiations, but that's going to be a contentious affair. America wants leverage and it wants uh, to get the Geneva process, the peace process that it has backed um, with some traction. And, and it believes that it can do so by holding this land and supporting uh, Kurdish nationalism. Uh, um, let, let me ask you, how has Russia managed to get itself in, in what it appears to be an extremely strong position? Well, of course, it took advantage uh, of a specific moment and it captured it and it jumped in when no one else was, uh, was willing to do so. I think, uh, you know, going back to what Josh was saying, um, I think it's important to define what we exactly mean by victory. Because this began in 2011. It, it wasn't about ISIS and it wasn't even about armed rebels. It was about something entirely different. So is the question here whether or not the Syrian government... Well, just help us here. Well, what was it about? Well, it was it about... Such a long time ago. It, it wasn't even about Assad, as, as, as you mentioned. It was about people who wanted reform. They wanted what they called pride, dignity. Student they, demonstrations. That yes, sort of stuff very peaceful demonstrations. Yeah. Now, did the Syrian government win over these people? I mean, w w w what type of victory are you talking about? Is it ISIS? ISIS was, you know, uh, a sudden distraction, a mutation of, uh, of some sort that no one really expected. We can talk about victory over ISIS. But even then, it's, 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 it's not necessarily this overwhelming victory that, that people are describing. So I, I think it's, it, there are important nuances here that, that are important to, to, to bring out, so to speak. OK, so, so if Russia has managed to, to do particularly well out of a certain situation, we'll, we'll describe yes. what that is in just a moment. Yes. Uh, what about Iran? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the interesting thing about Iran is it's extremely strategic. You know, even before 2011, you know, we, we would notice in Syria how suddenly uh, a point would be designated in Syria that is somehow of significance religiously. Then, you know, people, pilgrims would be flown in. Then, you know, suddenly there's a cultural center. You know, the, the way in which Iran operates is, is, is uh, not quite, you know, the Russian way and definitely not the Syrian government's way. You know, it, it, it's a whole different ballgame, so to speak, and I think it needs to be you know, understood on its own terms. Ibrahim, you've been in and out a number of times. I think yeah. the last time was April of this year. But over the last few years, you've been in trying to, to help with the, some kind of legal framework for those people fighting, fighting the government. How have you noticed the nature of the conflict and the nature of the expectations change since you first went in? Right, so th that brings us into to the introduction uh, that Omar was, talk was talking about um, in the sense of uh, why people went out in, in the first place uh, and then how did that uh, uh, change? Because a lot of people frame the opposition um, as if there is a political problem in Syria, right? So people were fighting for more seats at some sort of a, a cabinet or something along these lines. It wasn't. It was purely a human rights uh, um, kind of uh, situation. And as the conflict developed, that kind of mandate was still there. The means to achieve that changed. Um, and so we see after, I think, one of the turning points was the Russian military intervention. And I say military intervention because prior to that, there was a lot of political intervention in the Security Council. Well, this is what Omar was referring to. So, so go into the detail of why Russians, because this is historical as well, right, why Russia decided to get involved. Right. So. Um, Syria is technically Russia's last uh, foothold in the, in the Middle East with growing U.S. presence uh, there in, in, in Iraq, in, uh, in Jordan, uh, Turkey is a NATO ally. Uh, Russia needed a foothold in the Middle East uh, on the Mediterranean Sea. Tartus being a, a, a base of the Russian exactly. Region, and now they're expanding. Exactly. Yeah. Tartus, Hamimim, there's a number of military bases there. But we think it's, it, it was more of a, uh, of a battle, a match in the Security Council to say, uh, I've allowed it in Libya, I will not allow it in, in, in Syria. It's, it, it got Russia back on the map. Um, and um, that is something that armed groups realized inside, inside of uh, uh, Syria, that now um, militarily things are becoming very, very difficult. Um, 
Russia is providing air support and also mil uh, uh, troops uh, boots on the ground, and Iran is supplying an endless uh, count of, uh, of, of militants. Add that to, to Hezbollah, Iraqi militias, and, and the rest of the crew. So militarily, things have been going very, very difficult. But victory in this situation in Syria should not be measured by who gains more land. And I know you believe that there was some sort of victory. We'll, yeah. we'll come to that in a moment. Let's just go back to Josh um, in, in Italy. Uh, when it comes to mistakes that were made that perhaps allowed a major power such as Russia and also Iran to establish much more strongly their position within Syria, what was the biggest mistake you think that other sides made to allow that to happen? Well, the biggest mistake was clearly on the part of the rebels who could never unite. The United States and Hillary Clinton, Secretary of State, were really interested in getting the international community behind Syria in the way they had in Libya to get rid of the Assad regime. But very quickly, they discovered that they did not have a unified force, that the Muslim Brothers won in most of the elections in the Syrian National Council. They didn't like it. They kept on asking for new elections. What the Syrian people wanted, which was a higher degree of Islam, made America and the West very uncomfortable. They couldn't unite. Arms were poured in, but the Syrian, the, the, the rebels that were backed by the United States kept on losing to more radicals. You know, ISIS may have been a distraction, but it became all important for the United States. The United States could not allow Al Qaeda or ISIS to win and capture Damascus. Ultimately, they swung their support away from the rebels and really have supported Assad. Not that they like him but they have concentrated on destroying rebel strength, ISIS and Al-Qaeda, not on destroying Assad. And that has helped them more than anything else. In order to understand Syria, we have to understand that Syrians don't all feel like brothers. They don't all treat each other equally, and they haven't been treated equally through history. And this creates a big problem. The regime, the security part of the regime, is dominated by Alawites, a minority group. They were terrified. That Which is the Assad not, family, just to clarify. Yeah. The Assad family and yeah. most of the soldiers around him. They believed that if they allowed the demonstrations to grow and themselves to be pushed out the way Mubarak was or Tunisia, that the entire Alawite minority would be swept to the margins of Syrian history and possibly ethnically cleansed. And, and this is what terrified They were worried that they would be like the Sunnis in Iraq, which they had just watched driven out of power, a minority who had domination over the country through the security forces. So they didn't want to end up like the Sunnis. They didn't want to end up like the Palestinians in Israel where the Jews have pushed them aside. Or Ibrahim, you, you come in on that, but I want to ask you a little bit about some of your work in just a moment. Sure, yep. just to, to come back, back to that. I think, okay, the, the minority-majority thing uh, plays a role, but I don't think the disunity stems just from that. Um, we must remember that, you know, Syria was built in a way, uh, the, uh, the Syrian society, because of the kind of security institutions that you couldn't trust your brother, you couldn't trust your father. Anyone could be someone that could speak to the government or, or be... Or be an informant. The fact is, you do have a lot of Sunnis fighting, uh, or at least initially fighting with Assad. You have a lot of Sunni ministers that that, that are there. But the reason that there is a lot of disunity is that um, the way the Ba'ath Party operated is that you cannot succeed unless you make your opponent or competitor fail. And we see that in the, in the rebel mentality. We see that in a lot of civil, even civil society mentalities. I can only succeed if I make the other person fail. And that allowed the, the Ba'ath Party to strive in power, which led to disunity. With the moment you have uh, uh, chaos, yeah. people could no longer work with each other because of the lack of distrust that was there the, for The work you've years. been doing on the ground, and tell us about the last time you sure. were there, is to try and give those forces opposed to us add some sense of unity, particularly when it comes to a legal framework for the war that is, is being fought. So no, what we try to do is advocate with these parties to comply with international law. We, we, we advocate with them to not use certain weapons that, that are, are illegal, certain tactics, certain, certain methods. Um, so we try at least to, to get them to kind of uh, uh, sign or agree to some sort of a legal framework that respects the laws, uh, that the laws of war. Noticing, of course, and make, taking careful note that the majority, the vast majority of the crimes are happening from the uh, uh, from from the from the government uh, side, but that got me a lot of access into uh, uh, into Syria to see the, the the mentalities, and I can see a, a clear shift from 
before the Russian military intervention and, and afterwards in terms of the, the, the morale that, that, that people had to kind of fight against How would you the, characterize the, it the, the government. So um, before 2015, um, I would say a lot of people thought that there could be a military victory, right? You, you could be able, you could uh, uh, win. Uh, after t uh, September 2015, when the, when the Russians uh, uh, interfered, that, that was a, um, a game changer. They said, OK, you no, know, this militarily things are, 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 are very complicated. But by then, the political kind of atmosphere was so uh, difficult to try and get unity and, and, and rearrange. Uh, rearrange uh, and was this the point, Omar, at which um, Assad probably realized that um, he was pretty safe where he was, when the, the Free Syrian Army, which I mean, I'd interviewed representatives of that group for, for years and wondered what they were actually doing because they were so disunited. But was that a point at which the, the Free Syrian Army completely disintegrated and uh, Assad realized that you know, it had gone his way to some extent? Well, I, I think it's, it's, uh, it's a bit dangerous to personalize this too much. In other words, you know, it's, it's not so much about a person. It's not so much about the Syrian president. I think, I think it's more about a system in place. The, the real question is, I think it, 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 the, the worst thing that could have happened for the protesters who, who initially protested in 2011 is for the rebels to have won because the, the rebels don't represent them. In the vast majority of cases, these rebels that we see on the ground do not represent the protesters who were not only Sunni, there are Alawites and Christians in 2011. I know many friends who were arrested who were, who were Christians. <laughs> there were young Christian girls and, and, and Alawite you know, students. You know, this wasn't, it was much bigger than this. So what would have happened, do you think, if the rebels had won then? I, I think they, they would ha we would have had the, the bath in reverse. They would have suppressed okay. the very protesters that, that the bath was protest that suppressed in 2011. See, either way, you know, the, the, these are authoritarian approaches to, to society. And, and the, they both, you know, they may have very different discourses, but in the final analysis, they use the same methods. So uh, it, it's not about this. I, I think the real question is, can we, can we arrive at a Syria where we have free elections, Truly free elections. We're, we're are you talking uh, about nationally or are you talking about in different regions uh, that are operating on a I'm federalist talking, I'm level? I'm talking about ac across the board. You know, c can we have a Syria where people, re regardless of their you know, religious or you know, background, ethnic background, feel safe, secure, proud to belong to this country? This is, there are simple questions. But I, I think these are the questions that get, you know... Well, they're fundamental, uh, aren't they? Yes. And, and there are, the, are the questions of the people on the ground. The vast majority of the Syrians I know do not identify neither with you know, the, the armies you know, fighting on the government side, the various militias and, and all of that, no, n nor with the rebels. Not at all with the rebels, not, not even on, a, on mm. the political opposition. Josh, um, simple questions, as I must say, but very difficult answers. Um, are we ever going to see a, a unified Syria again? Well, that is, that's the million-dollar question, and I, I agree with both Omar and Ibrahim about the complexity of this fight how uh, there were not good answers for the liberals and the people demonstrating. Uh, once, once the bullets flew, everything fell apart in different ways. One can see a way forward for Syria if, I mean, the only way one can see forward is for the first time, there are governments, Lebanon, Damascus, Baghdad, and Iran are friendly to each other. In the last 50 years, they have disliked each other immensely. There's been no free trade between Iraq, Iran, Syria. Today, there are friendly governments. New pipelines could be built that crisscross those four countries. Iran's immense oil and gas could be brought out to the Mediterranean and compete with Russia's gas to Europe. This could help revitalize the economy. The real question is, is the fighting amongst Russia and America, Shiites and Sunnis, going to allow for a peaceful resurgence and rebuilding of Damascus. And unfortunately, partly because of the uh, oppressiveness of the Assad regime and the arm wrestling between Russia and America, Saudi Arabia and Iran, it looks unlikely that this kind of rebuilding and, um, and reconstruction will take place anytime soon. So what's your prognosis then? Oh, well, first of all, because tell us, first of all, about your, your family in Damascus. Right now, how has life changed for them?
Well, I, I, you know, the, the irony is, I mean, the mom and dad, isn't it? Right. Well, Damascus is, is, is more or less like a bubble, you know. I mean, of course, then at any minute, you know, you can have indiscriminate shelling from the so-called opposition who, who are supposed to, you know, represent, you know, Syrians as, as, as a whole. You know, it, it, it's, it's, it's complex and it's sad. And I think, you know, Damascus is probably, and probably the coast, are one of the few places where the Syria we once knew, to a certain extent, a lot of qualifications, uh, continues. The, the, the question is, can, can this be all of Syria, you know, w once again? I, th I think... Th so th they lead a relatively normal life there, would you say? Well, well, yes, until suddenly something very exotic and strange takes place, like you know, a shell falling, you know, in, in a market, or, you know, seeing, you know, a checkpoint, an endless uh, array of checkpoints. They go out, their friends go to work. Yes, yes. You know, pe people, the, the capacity of people to... To continue, you know, whatever you know remains of normality is, is is infinite. Yeah. I think what we also need, need to be uh, careful of is how we define a normal life. Um, I mean, with normal life. I li think I said relatively. Yeah. So no, mm -hmm. but, but even if, if it's a matter, is it basic needs? Um, yeah. I mean, uh, is it going to work, being able to feed uh, to feed your family and, and all of that? Then maybe yes. But if we, by normal uh, uh, life, mean their ability to express what what they feel like or go out and protest not. or anything of that sort, of course not. It you you return to the Syria prior to 2011 with far more kind of uh, paranoia from the state security is that to try and, and and be careful of who's doing what where right. more check points, uh, yes, you can still go to work, uh, but anything outside the kind of uh, uh, normal routine that is built for you is, 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 is unacceptable. And, and even feeding feed your family in places like the Ghouta, which is, you know, just 10, 15 kilometers away from Damascus, is, is extremely difficult right now. Mm. So, you know, it, it, of course, it, it all depends on, on where you are and then what exactly you are experiencing. Mm. Sorry, Ibrahim. Jo Josh, um, I'll come back to you in a minute, if I may. Yeah. Who's going to decide eventually what Syria whether it be different regions, a broken up country, whether it's one national uh, Syria again, who's going to decide how it looks in the future? Well, well, the big players are Assad and Russia today. I think Assad is going to push to take much more territory in Idlib next to the Turkish border and, and also push down to the Jordanian border. He needs trade. He needs to get money for his country to rebuild. Otherwise, his government's going to fail. So he's going to continue fighting and take back these territories, I believe, with Russian support. The big question is what happens with the Kurdish region, the 25% of the country, which the United States is overflying with its jets today. It's, he cannot take that back so long as the United States wants to keep it out of his control. And, and that's really, the, those are the deciders, Turkey, the US, Russia, Iran. They're going to have to make the decision on where borders are going to be drawn, how long they want to stay in the America in the mm. Syrian theater. And, and, and the, the, the real, well, one of the really sad things is not only have so many lives been lost, but so many people have had to flee the country. And, mm -hmm. and the history has shown that refugees not always go back. So Syria has lost some of the best minds and best people it could have had. Yes, and, and uh, you, you meet these, you know, on a trip, recent trip to Germany, you meet these people, you know, it's, it's, uh, it breaks your heart, you know, people who uh, could have contributed so much and who, who again, who, who didn't necessarily leave because, you know, they, they have a specific position against or for. You know, they left because they weren't safe. They, they left because they, they were tr truly afraid or, or they left because they couldn't feed their family. You know, they, they, uh, unless these, these questions are captured, you know, and, and, you know, there's almost something within us all that, that wishes, you know, all of Syria can be, you know, tomorrow recaptured by the government so we can close this chapter and, and move on to, to the questions of, you know, what, what about human dignity? What, what about fee feeding, you know, the UP? What about feeling secure? These questions that keep being, you know, sidelined by questions about what happens in Idlib. Yeah, as though it you, you, in any way represents the real story. You, you've both made your lives outside Syria, not necessarily because of, of what's happened. You just have lives elsewhere. Would you ever consider the possibility that either of you might go back to live in Syria? Absolutely. Instantly. I, I, there is no bigger dream of, my, of mine to be part of, you know. And again, I don't consider myself, you know, a, a member of the opposition or, or, or I'm, I'm a Syrian who loves his country and, and who wants to, to, to play a role in contributing to his country and, and who wants to kill him to stop 
and, and who wants, you know, basic things, like, mm. like to people, not to be scared of, of being humiliated or, or mistreated simply because they may have a position that, you know, someone in the government doesn't like. Okay. We're coming to the end of the program. I mean, I know you'd like to go back. Do you think it's ever likely? I well, say go back. I mean, go, go to live there. Um, Is it likely? Well, I... It, it, I stopped predicting when it comes to Syria now because things change so much um, um, on, 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 on both sides to try and figure out whether, whether or not the, the country will be able to be livable again. And for me, as someone who works on human rights and international law, it, it, um, the, the Assad or the government or the system has not won because for us it's, it's a continuous battle of pushing until we get the kind of rights that, that we asked for. And until these rights are guaranteed, and I'm not talking about just uh, food and, and, and living uh, a life for <laughs> you're stripped of, of, of dignity and, and, and pride and, and full of humiliation, then the answer would be for me, and I'm assuming for a lot of Syrians, uh, uh, no in, 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 that, in that context. Seven years come March that we will have been talking about this, and if, let's say, in 12 months' time we are having similar conversations, we'll know that um, the hopes of millions of people, and it has to be millions of people, that this could have been settled some way, uh, whatever, um, have not come to pass. Let's hope. That isn't the case. Thanks for watching Roundtable for me, David Foster and the team. See you next time. Bye-bye.